So thank you very much for, for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And it's uh, um, what Vijay didn't mention is I grew up in Irvine. I lived here until I was 15. So it's always really nice to come back. Um, but uh, I had the chance to uh, do some work with uh, Vijay over the past. And I've always enjoyed these encounters. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Glenn, for hosting us. That's really, really very kind. Uh, I'm going to talk about this, this day after tomorrow thing. Um, first of all, I know that there is a disaster movie with the same title. Uh, um, I spend many enjoyable conference calls with the movie studio to clear the rights to be able to make this book. Um, but it's something that is the culmination of things that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and working with companies. And it's really that what you mentioned, Bezos day one, day two. The basic idea of the day after tomorrow is very simple is that most companies spend the majority of their time looking at tomorrow with what they know today. And in a world that is changing so fast, that makes no sense anymore. And it's really a warning to figure out what your day after tomorrow is going to be, calculate back, and you might come up with a different tomorrow. And that's the whole idea behind the book. Um, many of you are very well familiar with everything that happens in the digital scene. And I'm going to try and cut that short. Um, I think I'm not the only one who gets goosebumps as a technologist to see what kind of enormous evolution that we're going through. And for some people who don't understand technology, it might seem scary, and it is. I often have um, in Europe a little bit of a, a connotation that people think I'm just there to scare people, and I do. I can really, really scare people. But that's not my job. I mean, my job is to figure out what we're going to do in a world that, in my opinion, is going really, really fast. The irony, it's very recent. Um, I always like to show this. This is the very first tweet, um, 2006. That's only 11 years old. And then this was my favorite image of the last presidential campaign. Um, I think this is an amazing visualization of how technology has really captured the attention of everybody. And it's become really absolutely normal. It is scary. Um, this is the scariest thing that I saw last week. Um, Paris Hilton tweeted about the introduction of a new cryptocurrency called uh, Lydian coin. And the fact that Paris Hilton is tweeting about cryptocurrency is one of the scariest things I have <laughs> ever seen. I think this is, in all honesty, one of the seven signs of the apocalypse. Uh, so we're about to be, I think, um, entering a zone which is going to be more than weird. Um, I think technology is so ingrained into our everyday lives. This is the nativity scene if you want to be hip now these days, uh, because what you do is you, you have to take a selfie of the baby Jesus. That is basically you know, the best way to actually um, use that. If you want to announce any changes in your family, you throw it on Instagram. And if you have twins, you get 10 million likes. And at the same time, we see that everybody's connected, but people get lonely. Um, it's amazing to see that we are in an ultra-connected society, but we also see the dark side or even the dangerous side of that. This is my most depressing slide. You have two people in bed. And their faces illuminated by the shining of their smartphones. And, and the irony is they could even be texting each other. How incredibly sad is that? <laughs> and in all honesty, it's close to reality. I mean, the first thing that I do when I wake up is I check my smartphone. And probably the last thing that I do before I fall asleep is I make sure that my smartphone is charging. Because the worst thing in the morning is to figure out that it's dead. Then, it's a wasted day. I think it's a public holiday if your smartphone <laughs> is dead. And this is an environment where um, I have two kids. I have an 18-year-old daughter and a 14-year-old. The 14-year-old loves gaming. This is the game he loves to play. It's called Grand Theft Auto, which is one of the most disgusting games ever. Huh? Um, and you've seen the troubles that Samsung had last year with their exploding phones. This is the latest incarnation of Grand Theft Auto, where next to a grenade, you can pick up a Samsung Note Galaxy and use that in the game to basically blow up stuff, which is <laughs> fascinating to see how quickly reality and the world of virtual has actually caught up. And honestly, this is crazy. Huh? And, and we're just getting started. If you look at this, these are words that were like interesting to debate a couple of years ago. And now they're boring 
They're really boring. If you hear somebody talking about social media strategy, you think, oh, God. You know? And it's amazing that really cool technologies like mobile and social and cloud and big data has become boring so quickly. And my point is, it's probably going to accelerate. I believe that we get onto this day after tomorrow where a set of technologies that is maybe just beyond the horizon is going to have more impact than anything we've seen before. So there seems to be an acceleration. And, and I get excited about this acceleration for the very simple reason is you won't be able to avoid it anymore. Uh, one of my colleagues at LBS is uh, Linda Gratton, and she's done a lot of work on the 100-year life. And I love that concept because um, kids born today have a pretty good chance of becoming 100. And that basically means that we can't organize our lives the same way. I mean, when I was growing up, it was you, you study until 22, and I, I, I still had the naive idea when I was studying that my studies would give me enough knowledge to last until retirement. Well, that's, that was very naive. Huh? Mm -hmm. But think about a 100-year life. How are you going to organize your life? Because in a world that is changing so fast, you're going to have to keep on learning like crazy. And I get excited because these changes are absolutely here. I, as Vijay said, I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. I spend too much time in Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley is a crazy place. Um, somebody once coined it 400 square miles surrounded by reality. And I think that's, that's close to the truth. Huh? And if you spend too much time there, you get naturally high on the optimism about technology. But today, we're seeing that the world starts to believe this. The, the five largest companies on the stock exchange are all tech companies. This used to be the place where you had Exxon's or you know, Walmart. And, and the six largest brands in the world Five of them are tech companies. Hmm. So this is no longer just an anomaly in located in 400 square miles surrounded by reality. This has become mainstream. And we're seeing that this is changing society. And this has become maybe too intense. And if digital transformation goes too fast, we talk about disruption. And I get excited about it because I'm still a nerd at heart. You wouldn't think that I'm a nerd when you look at me, but I can guarantee you I'm genuine, 100% nerd. Huh? And what is interesting is I get excited about technological change, and then I do sessions like this in front of the board of directors of an insurance company, and these people don't always share the same excitement <laughs> about technology as I do. Huh? Alan, I'm, I'm sure you appreciate that, right? Uh, I recognize them. <laughs> <laughs> and, Two examples. There are two European examples, but just to give you an idea, ING is a, a really big Dutch bank, um, and I know them really well. I did the board education of ING on technology, and last year they announced they were cutting 7,000 jobs because of digital transformation. And this is the CEO of the company, Rolf Hammers, a really clever guy, and he says, I don't like to fire 7,000 people, but it's about being relevant. And we've got 7,000 people that we can't retrain, and that's really scary. Um, this happened um, uh, on Wednesday. I don't know if you read the Financial Times, but there was an amazing article in the FT. So Deutsche Bank, one of the largest banks in the world, had their CEO talking at some investment conference. And um, he said, a big number of bank employees will lose their job as a result of digital transformation. And what he said was, harsh, and I'll read it out. He said, um, we have to end the era that his employees are accountants acting like human abacuses. That's, ooh, you know, if, you're, if you've worked at that bank for 37 years, you know, counting the numbers, and your boss says, ah, you're just an abacus, that, I think that hurts. Huh? And he said, we don't need as many people, and I love it. He says, in our bank, we have people behaving like robots, doing mechanical things. Tomorrow, we're going to have robots behaving like people. And I think, honestly, I think this is just the beginning. And I get excited by this. I get excited about the fact that we're going through revolutionary times, fast transformation, but it's something that is very real. And I think it happens sector by sector by sector. If you remember 10 years ago, the media industry was hit like a tsunami in digital. And people said, thank God we're not in the media industry. Huh? 
I mean, some of you who work in respectable businesses, you know, like insurance and finance and motorcycles, huh? I think you all said, thank God I'm not a media company. And what is interesting is that it was a really rough ride and they've rebounded. I, I love this slide. What you now see is that media now is at a revenue where after 10 years it's recovered and it's figured out how to deal with the Spotify's and the iTunes of this world. And now I think honestly you see that there are winners in the media and maybe some of you might be able to take some lessons from those sectors that have been hit 10 years ago. So yeah, kind of cool. This is one of my favorite videos. This is the introduction of the self-driving um, uh, Uber in San Francisco last year. And this is a complete fake video. Okay? And the reason is, at the moment, it was the only self-driving Uber in San Francisco. And all the other self-driving Ubers, they were in Pittsburgh. And you probably know why Pittsburgh, because Carnegie Mellon is in Pittsburgh, and Uber had bought the entire department at Carnegie Mellon doing self-driving cars. They had 49 researchers doing amazing stuff at Carnegie Mellon on self-driving cars, and Uber bought every single one of them. They offered to multiply the salary of the researchers by a factor of five. And these researchers said, okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> and Uber said, you don't even have to leave the building because we bought the building as well. Okay. I love this image. This is a self-driving auto truck delivering a fleet of self-driving Ubers to where they will be deployed. And this would have been absolute science fiction five years ago. And this is reality. And this is wow. And this is ooey. Huh? This is the first self-driving Uber crash in Scottsdale, just out of Phoenix. And they immediately suspended the program. They did the analysis. And after three days, they realized it was a human error. It was not the algorithms, and they continued. And I think this is exactly where the next 20 years, we're going to see more of this. We're going to see wow and aye at the same time. I mean, we are going to go through fundamental changes, but it's going to be scary and wow at the same time. And of course, Uber has more issues than that at this moment. But we get to a situation where technology is going to be an amazing opportunity, it's going to be really scary. And you know, I'm always reminded of that when you look at that. I mean, MIT, you look at the smartest companies out there, and you think, is it real? Or is it just fake? And I'll show you a word. I mean, I live in Belgium, which is next to Germany, and I love the German language. The German language has an amazing capability to create words that are unique. They have words for things that other people don't have words for. And this is one of my favorite German words. It's called Eisenbahnscheinbewegung. Okay? <laughs> I want you to practice on that, but not now. <laughs> and Eisenbahnscheinbewegung exactly explains the, where, where, where I feel sometimes. And Eisenbahn is the railways, and Scheinbewegung is a false move. So uh, we were talking about soccer earlier. Soccer players have the tendency to do a move where the other opponent says, ah, he's going to do that, and they do exactly the other thing. This is called a Scheinbewegung, so it's a false move. And this is the false movement of railways. And what does it mean is you're in a, in a railway car, and next to you is another railway car, and you're both stationary, but the other starts to move, and you think you're moving, which is like a really strange feeling. And this is what the Germans created a word for, Eisenbahn Scheinbewegung. And in the world of technology, I spend a lot of time with these crazy startups, and sometimes I think, are they moving? Or are you guys moving? Is it a false movement? I don't know. The only thing I know is we're going to go through an enormous transformation. And when you talk about digital transformation, most companies are still in denial. This is one of the most depressing books I've ever read. It's called On Death and Dying by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and it describes the five stages of grief of people who become terminally ill. If you have cancer, you first think, no, this is impossible, denial. Then you get angry. You think, really? I, I, I drank kale juice and, and I, I jog and I have cancer? And then there's bargaining. You know, what can I take to have six more months? And then depression and acceptance. And, and this is exactly the same thing in digital transformation. And most companies are still in denial. And I think 
this is, I spend a lot of time with companies. I, I take them to Silicon Valley. This has become a, a really strange activity. Um, and I'm always reminded when I'm doing a, a, a bus tour in Silicon Valley, explaining what happens. Um, this is my grandfather. And in 1946, just after the war, he bought a bus. And in uh, Europe, he started driving people um, to Lourdes in the Pyrenees, where there is a cave where Mother Mary appeared. And my grandfather became a relatively successful entrepreneur by driving busloads of Catholics to Lourdes to see the miracle. And every time I'm in Silicon Valley, I think, I mean, I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm taking them to the new Lourdes, you know, which is basically what I do. I come from a, a long line of nerds. This is my father. Um, this is me. And this is my son. And to give you an idea of how nerdy, I'm, I'm one of the largest collectors of vintage IT in Europe. Um, I collect uh, a lot of old um, apples. Uh, this is a Lisa, the pre-Mac version. Uh, to give you an idea of how nerdy, this last weekend, um, together with my son, we actually took an old enterprise, an AIE 180 analog computer that we bought in Hamburg and reassembled it and showed some Lisa Jun. That's pretty nerdy stuff. Huh? So I, I'm a hardcore nerd. But one of the strange things about hardcore nerds is we're really, really bad at you know, predicting the future. I did startups for a long time, and after the startups, then I started getting online. Um, I worked with a lot of companies on figuring out how to do their digital transformation. What is really interesting is I've come to four big questions in life. And, and the number one question I have is, I, I don't understand why many of the big companies that I work with are filled with extremely smart people like you, and they seem to have a really difficult time of seeing new things. And I just don't understand that. The second thing is that I see big companies like you are realizing that there's new stuff, and then they buy companies, startups, and then it's incredible to see how really good you are at screwing them up <laughs> so quickly in record time. I became fascinated by big companies like yours filled with smart people need consultants to tell them what to do while all these consultants do is basically help you figure out what you already know. And then the number one thing is, how can you actually help companies accelerate that? And that's really what I wanted to write in that day after tomorrow. I'm always reminded of this amazing book by Charles Dickens. And the opening line is one of my favorites. It's the best of times and it's the worst of times. And I think this is exactly where we are in the world of technology. And we technologists, worst to predict the future. Bill Gates, smart man, in 1998, he was asked to say something visionary about the future, and he said, eventually, everyone's business card will have an email address on it. If during the reception, you're going to get a business card from somebody else here, and it doesn't have an email address, there's only one conclusion, must be a very wealthy individual. That's the only logical conclusion. And it's crazy to see how in an extremely short period of time, you know, technology has become absolutely normal. We don't even consider it technology anymore. World leaders feel comfortable with technology. Most world leaders feel comfortable with technology. <laughs> a cat can become a sensation on Instagram. Every moment is a technology moment. And I love this. Last year, there was a, a baseball game in South Florida. Baseball bat swung into the audience. Everybody's panicking, except this little boy who had no idea what was going on. <laughs> And there you see how this next generation is, is a mirror, is a lens into a world where we're constantly connected. And I wrote a book on this a couple of years ago, The New Normal. It's about what happens when technology becomes normal. This is where digital is an adjective. This is where digital is just normal. And it's amazing to see that I come from a different world. Um, this is an advertisement in 1980. I was living here in Irvine. My father had a magazine with this ad advertising a 10 megabyte hard disk for $3,495. I mean, you're an infra. Uh, it's crazy to see. I mean, 10, you, you send a, any PowerPoint is 10 megabytes. If you, if you make a, a PowerPoint 10 megabytes, you email it, and it doesn't go through the email immediately, 
people are frustrated with the losers in the IT department that they can't even do email. <laughs> That's the evolution in 35 years. And still we use old technology, uh, and, and so, sometimes in a, in a government context you, you find surprising elements. But actually I got this from, from Donald Jones. I mean, he's on the advisory board. He showed me this picture, and I love this. This is an African village, and a young child is going to undergo a voodoo ritual. This is the voodoo priest. But look here, okay? You see people using a smartphone to record the voodoo ritual. They could just Google voodoo ritual and realize it doesn't work. They choose to use that to record it. And honestly, I still see a lot of companies doing exactly the same thing. They buy new technology and they use it in a completely wrong way. And I think this is the transition. And, and I always show these two videos. I, I think I showed them in 2012. I'm going to show them again. I, I'm going to keep showing them. This is. In the old normal, we technologists would introduce new stuff. And we had no idea how to explain that to users. And users had no idea how to use technology. And in those cases, users often had a completely wrong case of using technology, <laughs> often with disastrous consequences as a result. Now, he doesn't work at Yamaha anymore. Um, <laughs> But I always show them this. This is the woman who's been out of the office for a long time and has no idea. <laughs> and you still get the joke, but you are the last of the Mohicans who gets this joke. And that is the interesting transition in a world where technology is hot. You cannot open a business magazine. We talk about the celebrity CEOs of technology, but it's a really harsh world, as you know. Blankberry stopped making Blankberries last year. Business Week put them on the cover as an ancient Canadian <laughs> communication tool. And it was fashionable to have a BlackBerry just a couple of years ago. We see the absurdity from a financial point of view. WhatsApp was acquired by Zuckerberg for $19 billion with no revenue, no revenue model, just 52 employees. And people thought it was crazy. And people said, oh, we, we talk about these unicorns with billion dollar valuations and it's going to it's crazy, and it is. This is a slide from 1999. If you remember the first dot-com hype, all you had to do in 99 was put dot-com after your name and you could claim any valuation. And honestly, if you go to the Bay Area, it's the same thing all over again. And we knew what happened in March of 2000, NASDAQ, boom, collapses. This year, it could happen again. And you know what? It won't make a difference because it's become normal. I was in Italy this summer where an Italian artist had painted the logos of today onto the artifacts of the past. And where you see how quickly things are disappearing, <laughs> how, we, how we communicate in a completely different way, how we live in a society in a different way. And I love this, two old ladies chatting away under a Twitter <laughs> sign. Beautiful, I mean, as an artist, I think it was a beautiful project. Huh? But we live in a world where this is the most normal <laughs> gesture known to this next generation. We've become really used to technology. What if we're only halfway there? The Atlantic talks about the touchscreen generation. We've heard the stories about the one-year-olds who are frustrated that the TV doesn't swipe. I love this one. Young girl writes to Santa, dear Santa, how are you? I'm good, here's a one for Christmas. And then the Amazon URL <laughs> of what this child wants to have under the Christmas tree. And we laugh, but my kids have grown up that order before 11 o'clock, and deliver the next day. I mean, if you're a retailer, that's going to have a huge impact. And, and we're only getting started. We live in a society where family reunion 20, 25 years ago, family reunion today, and then it's not tech, it's behavior. Adults, use of technology, teenagers. And this is making a phone call. You probably still use your smartphone to make a phone call. Teenagers never pick up the phone. When I ask my daughter, why don't, why don't you pick up the phone? You see that I'm ringing. Why don't you pick up the phone? Her answer is, it's awkward. <laughs> it's awkward to speak to somebody on their smartphone. And this is what I prefer. This, this is my favorite. This is email. We couldn't, you couldn't survive without email. Relevance of email to the next generation. I mean, both my kids have an Hinson.com email address. I thought that was like a gift. Huh? Never check it. I came home the other day. 18-year-old gives me her laptop because there was something to be done. 
and I am the sysadmin of the Hinson family, <laughs> open up the laptop, and I see that she has 3,472 unread mails. Now, I don't know how you feel if you have 3,472 unread mails. I panicked. She saw my panic. She took the laptop out of my hands. She opened email, did select all, delete, and said problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's something you should try from time to time. But my daughter's going to apply for a job at Yamaha in four years' time. And if on the first day you say, this is your laptop, and this is your Yamaha email address, she's going to look as if she's seen a dinosaur. And I think this is fundamental. If we want to understand this next generation, we've got to be more in tune. And this is something which is very difficult, because I never thought that would be, I always thought there was a cultural gap between me and my parents. I think we should be surprised what happens in the next generation. I'm going to show you a video. Uh, this is Casey Neistat. I don't know if you know Casey. I think he's one of the most influential people out there on social media and a voice for this next generation. This is a commercial he did for Samsung at the last Oscars. Look at this. Allow me to introduce the rest of us. We're the makers, the directors, and, and the creators of this generation. We don't have big award shows or huge budgets or fancy cameras, but what we do have are our phones and duct tape and parking lots and guts. And we have ideas we need to share. We know it's not the size of the production that matters, it's what you make. We don't create because we have to, we create because we love to. And we've captured billions of moments from different angles, for different reasons, for millions of viewers, but with one thing in common. When we're told that we can't, we all have the same answer. Watch me. I think this is brilliant. And I think this is exactly what we need to do more. We need to watch. Because if you want to understand how to influence your next generation of customers, they don't respond to TV ads anymore. And we've seen that maybe this consumer thing is, is a very good indicator of what that day after tomorrow could be. Now, I have no idea how old you are. I was drawn into this world of technology when my dad came home with this, hooked this up to the TV, and it produced that. That was a wow moment in my life. <laughs> and some of you are old enough to remember this. Some of you will have played this. This is the game I wanted to play. It was called Raiders of the Lost Ark on my Atari 2600. Bought this game, put it in my computer, my Atari, and it produced that. So let me go back. This is marketing, and this is reality. And look very closely here. In the middle, this was Indiana Jones in 1982. And I played it for months. This is the game my kids play on the PlayStation 4. The game is called Uncharted. This is the lead character, Nathan Drake. This is the evolution in 35 years. And if I see them playing this game, it's almost impossible to see what is real and what is virtual. And if you think it stops here, you're not paying attention. What if we're only halfway there? I mean, when I was a little kid, my mother had one important message for me in life. Don't sit too close to the TV. <laughs> and then this is the future, which is <laughs> ironic in so many ways. Huh? But we get into a situation, these are two slides from Facebook, where if you look at the online world, how quickly we've gone from you know, text to images to moving images, and, and we're about to take a next step. And we're about to engage consumers in ways that we couldn't have ever imagined. And it's something which is interesting, because Facebook is really incredibly aggressively putting that into an environment where the way to draw people in is going to radically change the type of engagement we can have. And they want to put that full front and center onto their platform, onto their network. Facebook Spaces was launched just before the summer. And this is what your kids are growing up on, where you will never have to explain to this next generation how to do a conference call. No? I mean, this is their way of engaging the network and enjoying content in ways we could have never imagined before. This is magically, they're out in, in, in Florida, it's a startup which has you know, attracted billions of dollars to basically make games so completely realistic that they actually project Star Wars into your living room. Imagine what this is going to do in terms of being able to really 
bring reality in a completely different environment. What this is going to do in a B2B type of environment, where the type of engagements we're going to have in a business context are radically going to be different. But you know, think about education. I mean, the way our kids are being educated today is medieval, if you compare to the day after tomorrow technologies. But not for everyone. Some people are going to have serious <laughs> difficulty in adjusting to this new reality, and, and they won't be able to cope. Huh? But this is my point. What if we're only halfway there? What if we were in a situation where, I mean, Google Lens launched just before the summer. You just take your smartphone, and it tells you exactly what it knows about that object or you know, that, that flower. I mean, this is now a smartphone, but yeah, we know they've been co-developing these contact lenses with Novartis to measure the glucose level in your blood to alert your smartphone to take insulin. And what if they build that into a contact lens? And, and the way that we experience reality is fundamentally going to be altered. I mean, I, I <laughs> think about the possibilities we're going to have. You walk into your fridge, and it tells you what is there and, and, and how healthy it is. I mean, think about things like dating. You, you have all the information about the person sitting right in front of you. They can see from the pulsating in the neck whether there is an arousal or an attraction. I mean, dating is never going to be the same. That is fun. But look at that. I mean, we're getting into a situation where I fundamentally believe we're only halfway there. And I think if you think about that, there's only one conclusion. We're going to see really stupid things. Because in that transition period, we don't know what it is. I have now, in the next two minutes, a selection of really stupid things that I have seen. This is a Dutch company launched a couple of weeks ago. And they're called Navigator Walking Shoes. And they're vibrating soles. And you Bluetooth pair them with your smartphone. And you're in a city that you don't know where to go. And you go to Google Maps. And your soles vibrate. It tells your toes to go left or right, oh, no. which is stupid huh? yeah. and kind of cool at the same time. <laughs> this is Kerastase. They launched this at the CES in Las Vegas in January. This is the world's first IoT Internet of Things hairbrush and filled with sensors. And every time you brush your hair, it just detects all the elements of your hair and then puts that into an algorithm in the cloud, and sends it to your companion app. And your companion app will tell you what your hair health score is. Fiji, you could, you could really use that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> this is stupid. Huh? And kind of cool at the same time. Huh? This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. It's called Pet Chats. This is a connected device for lonely pets. You, just, you can go to Amazon and buy this. It's, I think, 239 or 249 And you hang this on the wall. It connects to your Wi-Fi. You train your dog to put its wet nose against the screen. And this initiates a Skype call to the owner at work. So you can reassure your dog that you're going to be home soon. And in the premium version, you can then dispense dog treats, which is incredibly stupid. I mean, this is the second sign of the apocalypse next to you know, Paris Hilton, I mean, crazy. But connected pacifiers streaming all the vital signs of your baby to your smartphone. And, and I love to show this to a mixed audience of young and old people, because you show this to old people who've raised kids in an analog way, and you see them going, Dah. and you see the young people going, Dah. and that, that's where you see that difference between old and new normal. Two more things. This is, I was at Philips, and they make, amongst other things, razors. And, and they were very proud. They, they invited me to speak to their board. And they said, oh, we have, we have a new Series 7000 razor, and it has a companion app. I said, wow. Huh? And I said, what does the companion app do? And they said, it tells you when it's time to shave. And I think, <laughs> really? I mean, I've been doing that all my life. Huh? That's stupid. This is the dumbest thing, and then I'll stop. This is, a, this is for people who. Whether they're, if they're in, in doubt whether to open up another bottle, you cannot uncork another bottle unless you solve a puzzle on the smartphone <laughs> to see if you're not too drunk. <laughs> Let me give you this advice. If you need an app to tell you whether you're too drunk, you've probably had enough. That would be my logical conclusion. So crazy.
But what if we're only halfway there? I mean, if you see the transition we've had in our lifetime, we're going to see an acceleration because we have forces getting together. We have forces almost augmenting each other. And I think these are the four ones that are the big ones that are going to hit us. It's the age of networks. It's the rise of fluid data. It's turning that into intelligence and then automation. And it's a combination that is really interesting and scary at the same time. And if you look at networks, this is not new. I mean, we've seen that in the last couple of years. We've, we've seen this is a global network. I mean, we were talking about soccer. I mean, you can follow Liverpool here in Southern California. Yeah? And it's like you're at home. I mean, this is it, it better, even better. Huh? And what we've seen in the last couple of years is these global platforms have become powerhouses. We call them the gaff mats, the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks. In China, the Baidu, the Alibaba, the Tencents. They've been growing like crazy. And it's kind of scary because they are new economic players that we don't understand. And I think when Amazon bought Whole Foods, it was one of those pivotal moments. And um, we've all seen this little video. I mean, this came out well, March or April, something like that. And it showed Amazon Go and people walk into the store and they just pick from the shelf and they walk out like an Uber without having to go to the cash register and without having to pay or use a credit card. And I remember people asking me, why? Why does Amazon, they're, a, they're an online retailer for crying out loud, why? And then, bam, we knew when they bought Whole Foods for $13.4 billion. And this happened in June. And what was really interesting is they paid $13.4 billion. And it's not fair to compare it, but it's, it's really interesting to see what is going on in the retail space. It's, it's going to be a devastation out there. And actually, I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. And, and I, you can just imagine what happened in the boardrooms of the Walmart. And the, they did what? I mean, it's crazy. And this is my favorite moment. This is the announcement. And the moment that they announced they were buying Whole Foods for $13.4 billion, their stock went up by 3%. Now, if you know, Amazon has a market cap of $500 billion. So the market gave them 15 This is a, let me understand the economics here. This is really good, right? You pay $13.4 billion, and the market says, well done, here's 15 billion, keep the change. That's, that's kind of how it works, right? And then immediately, the Walmarts and the Costcos and the Targets, Kroger, it's been down 35% since that moment, and they have no way of recovering. So this is, winter is coming in retail. And I think this is interesting, because if you think about it, nobody saw it coming. They said, oh yeah, these big new digital players, and then bam, they get into analog, and you say, huh, and now what? I mean. The market cap of Tesla is way out of proportion. But with that, they could just buy. What, what if they did? I mean, honestly, we get into the situation where it's a whole different game. It's not just digital. It's digital getting into analog. And the traditional players are going to have to really think about this day after tomorrow. And, and it's not all great. I mean, let me, let me give you the most reassuring slide. Okay, This is the most reassuring slide in all my deck. This is the revenue of Google in the last couple of quarters. And what you see in green is search. And what you see in red, if you have very good eyes, is all the rest. And this is interesting. Google made $76 billion last year in search. And all the rest is so I, I have a lot of good friends who work at Google. And if I take them out for dinner, and I pour enough alcohol into a Google executive, by 2 o'clock at night, they will start to break down emotionally. And they will start to complain about legacy systems, and legacy people, and legacy procedures, and how they're incapable of finding their next thing. Now, this should be the most reassuring Slide for you. If you think, oh my god, what am I doing here? I should work for Google. No. I mean, even those guys are getting challenged. And I think this is really interesting. I mean, they're doing great stuff. And, and they're repurposing a lot of their technology. I mean, what they did with the driverless car and LiDAR, fantastic. Um, they're spinning it off. This is not called Waymo. Not too 
I'm not too hot about the design. I mean, my first reaction when I saw this was Ghostbusters. This looks like the, the car from Ghostbusters. But I mean, it's a thousand it's dollar stock now. And I think what you begin to see is it's fueled. And this is the crazy part about the Bay Area. I mean, venture capital is growing like crazy. This was Mark Andreessen when he was the CEO of Netscape. If you're old enough, you went online with a Netscape browser. Huh? Respect. Huh? <laughs> this is Andreessen now. And he wrote the famous op-ed piece called Software is Eating the World. And this is a sign from Andreessen where he says, the cost of technology is way down. And that's why we have these startups. And I, I remember, I did three tech startups. I sold one to Alcatel Lucent, one to Vodafone, and one IPO. And when I did my three startups, I had to raise literally millions of dollars just to get off the ground to afford networks and servers and storage and software and tech guys. And now any kid with a credit card is up and running just in the cloud. And that's a big difference. At the same time, we got productivity going up and, and markets online. So we've got something that is changing. And we have these network effects. And these network effects mean a very, very strange thing is that we seem to be getting absolute winners. And this is not good. One of my favorite articles last year in Newsweek was why the world hates Silicon Valley. And they said it's the new Roman Empire. I live in Europe. We had the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago. What did the Romans do? They exported their technology, aqueducts, viaducts, highways, and they used that to bring the riches back to Rome. This is exactly what the Bay Area is doing. They're exporting their technology. Every time you take an Uber anywhere in the world, 20% flows back to the Bay Area. Not the US, not California, the Bay Area. New Silicon Valley, new Roman Empire. And I think what you see is we get into this em environment where these network effects seem to be going into that era of exponential. Now, exponential, if we're not careful, if we keep on doing what we've always doing, we might end up blindsided. And that's the whole idea. I mean, this is not new. We've been talking about this. But if you keep using yesterday's logic onto a world that is changing fast, we're going to come up short. So think about this. How many of you in your business are still using yesterday's logic to think about the future? One of the strange things about network effects is it creates category kings. Category kings is winner takes all. Who's the number one in search? Google. Who's the number two? Hell, I don't care. <laughs> the market share of Google in search in Europe is 96%. And that's scary. Who's the number one in ride sharing? Uber. Who's the number two? Barely, barely making a dent as Lyft. Who's the number one in social media? Facebook. Who's number two? We don't actually care. And this is scary because it means that the 21st century economy has category kings. In the 20th century, where we grew up, we had many car companies, many motorcycle companies, many oil companies, many media companies. 21st century, category kings. And we're not used to that, which is scary. Google, Amazon, Facebook, China. I spend a lot of time in China. If you haven't been to China, go to China. I mean, it's fascinating to see where some of these companies are going. I'll give you a second example. Uh, it's Facebook. I mean, th this is one of my favorite ones. I mean, people say, oh, Facebook, is that really so important? I mean, this is the way Facebook reports to the market. <coughs> this is their community update. They do this every quarter. They're now over 2 billion. This is the one that I keep from just before the summer. 1.65 billion people are on the core platform. And they say, we're very big. I mean, 1.65 billion, billion on WhatsApp, almost a billion on Messenger, almost half a billion on Instagram, big, 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 big. And then they added one thing here, which I thought was fascinating. For the first time, they said AI, artificial intelligence, access for the blind and visually impaired. And at first, I didn't understand. Because, yeah. And today, if you post a picture on Instagram, it's run through their AI, recognize what's on the picture. Graham, if you're eating lasagna, and you take a picture on Instagram, they're going to run it through. They're going to see that you're eating a lasagna, and they will do you know, text-to-speech for your blind and visually impaired friends. Graham is eating lasagna. And I thought, huh? And then I met the team. They have 
world-class, beyond world-class AI researchers. They bought the best of the best computer vision AI researchers. They're capable of analyzing every image, segment, detect, and classify. They know exactly what's on every image, better than humans. Look, what's a muffin, what's a dog? Well, they've already figured it out. Huh? They know exactly what's on the picture. They can do it faster than humans. And they can scale it. And then you realize, my god, they don't just know that Graham is eating lasagna. They know what shirt you wear. They know what's in your house. They know what car you have. They know what dogs you have. They know what your kids are doing. They know everything for the blind and visually impaired. I mean, I love going there. The campus is magnificent. Zuckerberg hired Disney to pimp up the campus, filled with young people who believe in the power of the network. And this is my favorite graph. This is the total number of text messages of all the mobile operators on the planet. All the T-Mobiles, Sprints, Vodafones. And this is the total number of messages on WhatsApp. Now suppose you guys are, what's the biggest operator? AT&T? No? Verizon. Verizon. Suppose you guys are the, um, the people at Verizon, the department that runs text messaging. And in 2010, you guys are printing money. You guys are running text messaging Verizon in 2010. You're printing money. And then the board says, what's going to happen to text messaging? So what do you do? You go to Dana Point, and you do a three-day off-site. Huh? You think, oh, oh, oh. And after three days in, in Taranea, you say, that, that's going to happen. Huh? And then, bam, that happens. And that's disruption right in front of our very eyes. End of last year, there were twice as many messages on WhatsApp than of all the messages of all the operators on the planet. Today, it is seven times the volume. And they run every single image through their AI for the blind and visually impaired. You know what the number one fear is of the telcos, the Verizons? That they become a dump pipe. That they connect to you, but they don't know. But the dump pipe syndrome is going to happen in many, many industries. Banks could become dump pipes. Insurance companies could become dump pipes. I mean, we get into a situation where these types of players, and that's why I love this guy. Right? A lot of respect. This is my favorite image. The moment he was 22, he turned down a $1 billion offer from Yahoo to buy his company. And, and Fast Company put him on the cover as the kid who turned down a $1 billion. Honestly, respect. I don't know what you did when you were 22. But suppose you, you started something late at night. You get a phone call saying, hey, Alan, we like what you're doing. We're prepared to give you a $1 billion. To have the guts at the age of 22 say, no, thank you. Please don't call me this late at night. I do not appreciate it. I think it's fascinating. And they're just getting started. I mean. We see why people are saying, new Roman Empire. Today, Silicon Valley is a little bit of a rut with your new president. This is, I love this image. I mean, when he was still president-elect, he called the Silicon Valley leaders to meet. And Peter Thiel is his advisor, the only person in Silicon Valley who believed in Donald Trump. And the way that Tim Cook looks into the lens of the camera says it all. And if you've seen the movie, the cook, uh, the thief, his wife, and her lover, but this is a variation on the theme. Huh? <laughs> but at the same time, what we see happening is on the other side of the world, China is fascinating. I, I would really urge you to go to China. I mean, I, th th this is a graph that says a lot about what is happening in China at this moment. Uh, this is the world's GDP from 2,000 years ago until today. And for almost 2,000 years, China had one third of the world's GDP. And then something miraculous happened. They completely lost the Industrial Revolution. The percentage of China in world GDP dropped to below 10%. And, and they said, we, we don't know what happened. Huh? For almost 2,000 years, we were on top of our game. And then we just fell asleep during the Industrial Revolution. We just lost it. Huh? And the Chinese call this the 100 years of shame. And they are rapidly regaining. And today, their digital platforms are, in my opinion, more impressive than what is happening in Silicon Valley at the moment.
Today, China is expanding tremendously with the one silk, uh, the new Silk Road, the One Road, One Belt initiative. I don't know if you're aware about this, but the Chinese are using your new president as a wonderful mechanism to expand economically like crazy. And they are rapidly not just changing their economic paradigm, they're also taking their digital platforms with them, which means that all of these countries that they do business with in the One Belt, One Road are going to use WeChat and are going to use Alibaba and are going to use Baidu. And very soon, it's going to be a world where you have two extremes. I mean, Baidu is Google, very similar. Alibaba is Amazon on steroids. What they do, they just signed an agreement with Merce, the largest shipping company in the world, to completely not just do the B2B and the B2C, but everything in between. Fascinating what is happening there. Tencent is the owner of WeChat. WeChat is Facebook on steroids. It's not just communications, but it's applications. And honestly, I mean, financial services. I was in Shenzhen a couple of weeks ago. I went to a haagen in Shenzhen, and I took out my credit card, and I was laughed out of the store. A credit card is considered ancient technology in China. You all pay with your mobile phone using Alipay or WeChat. To give you an idea, they stared at me with my credit card as if I had just brought in a camel or a sheep to pay for my Hagen Das. It was incredible to see what is happening there. I feel like medieval if I go to China, if I see what is happening on the technology scene. Mobile payments in China, mobile payments in the US. And it's fascinating. I think we shouldn't underestimate that. There is something absolutely going on there. And to give you an idea, I mean, um, we now see that it's become like a dual world. It's Google and Baidu. It's Amazon and Alibaba. It's Facebook and WeChat. It's Uber and Didi. It's Tesla and BYD. It's YouTube and Yukutudo. It's Apple and Xiaomi. And I think what we're beginning to see is this is something that it's polarizing the world. But the power of networks is the absolute one thing that is making this an absolute capability. And we're building these category kings as a result. I do believe, and just one thing, we're going to see an opportunity to do it in a second round, which is what happens where 25 years ago, World Wide Web changed B2C and content for good. And it's going to happen again where we see the opportunities in B2B and in transactions with new types of network logic. And here we have to pay attention, because if we're not careful, the Chinese are going to beat the living crap out of us. Alan? I just want you to clarify a little bit. Before you said they're category owners, and now you're actually showing the opposite, which is you just have a much more global scale as to who the competitors are. So my, it's a very good question. And what I meant is you have a category king in one geography. So Europe is taking everything that comes out of Silicon Valley. And with the new Silk Road, it's going to be countries who say, we're going to either go for the ecosystem of the Chinese or the ecosystem of Silicon Valley. But in one geography, it's category kings. And is this going to be actually uh, to the point where it, it sort of stymies uh, our ability to do business in these places and to, and to vacation and to, and to traverse the world? Well, I think um, I, I, I do a lot of work for a company called Vinci, who operates airports. And they said, if we want to um, do something for Chinese tourists, we have to do Alipay in our shops, because they're not going to use credit cards anymore. They're not going to use cash anymore. The only way we can still cater to Chinese tourists is if we have Alipay in our stores. So yeah, fascinating. Now, the strange thing is, these are dynamics on a global scale we've never seen before. You can also say, and, and to add on to that, is in the 20th century, what we've seen is that nations have become less important than corporations. Okay? I live in Belgium. My father worked for Exxon. What is more important in the world, Exxon or Belgium? Ah, Exxon. Huh? But in the 21st century, where we have category kings, how is that going to play out? So geopolitically, we're going to enter an extremely interesting zone. Now, two information. I mean, I don't need to explain that to you guys, right? But the big transition, IT in the old normal was a lot of T, a lot of technology. 
and a small i, i t in the new normal, huge i, small t. And that's a complexity. And we, we've got to figure out how to transform organizations that are still, I see a lot of people digitizing who are taking their old paper-based processes and digitizing that, which is really a shame. You should rethink them for a world where digital is normal. I mean, let's be honest, turning it into true insights, not easy. And, and if we want to understand customers, we have to speak the language of the network. You, they're giving off heat every single moment. You've got to pick up those signals. You've got to interpret that. And you've got to figure out how to translate that into meaningful information. And this is something where, you know, again, these, they are the new oil companies. I mean, they are mining for information in ways that are much better than anything we've ever seen before. Now, close to home, um, this is one of my favorite examples. Um, in Disney World, you have these magic bands. Um, do they have them in Anaheim? No. no, they don't have them here. Um, but in, because the infrastructure involved to, to bring it up is quite significant. But in Disney World, since 2013, you have the magic bands. And you know it, it's a bracelet, and it's all you need. You get into the park with your magic band, you, you open the door of your hotel boom, with your magic band, you walk through the park, they know exactly where you are, you pay for everything. You pay for a hat, a burger, a t-shirt, boom, with your magic band. My two kids realized the potential of that in three seconds flat. I got a very interesting bill five days later. But the average upspend is 17%. It's huge. But the customer satisfaction went up at the same time. And the reason is they know where you are. And if you want to go to Space Mountain at 3 o'clock, you put it in your app, and they know where you are. And you get an alert saying, ah, wait 45 minutes. That 45 minutes that I don't have to wait in line is very valuable to me. I'm willing to spend 17% more. And what this shows is if you make customers understand the added value of the information you extract, then it becomes a transaction. What I see is many companies saying, yes, big data. We need to capture as much as possible of our customers. That's old school. Think about how can you transform that into value add for your customers. And that's completely different. So what we've learned from these companies is that if you look at it, they focus on relevance. They don't focus on average. They focus on the unique individual customer. What they did is that they don't report. They turn information into true value. What they did is they make it very proactive because they alert you before something happens. And the most important thing is they really understand how to leverage the power of the network to make this even more powerful. Now, these are things that companies are going to have to do if they really want to reinvent themselves in the age of networks. I believe we're going to do it all over again. I get terribly excited about new networking logic. Um, and I don't like Paris Hilton being involved, but there is absolutely something there. And honestly, I think this is going to be an enormous opportunity to get it right. Now, what is interesting is that best of times, worst of times, what happens when a lot of these things are going to add complexity? Because we need to be more connected, and the more connected, the more danger it becomes. We're going to have more vulnerabilities. I see a lot of people like you having an enormous difficulty just attracting the right talent in IT security. Why would they want to work for you? I mean, I see banks struggling to get the right security guys on board because all the best guys are poached by Google or Amazon. And then we get into a situation where we're going to have to really figure out how to do this. Now, AI. We've seen the signs. Deep Blue, 1997. Deep Mind, two years ago. Lee Sodol, the best Go player in the world, humiliated by Deep Mind. He hated that. Um, what m many of you don't know is that after the famous match of March last year, he asked for a rematch. They've now played 53 rematches. And Google won 52. What happened in the 53rd was amazing. Some IT guy tripped over a wire and accidentally unplugged DeepMind, and they called it a draw. <laughs> and now Google said, Lee, we're not going to play you anymore. Um, this is my favorite one, Libratis. 
Librantus comes from uh, Carnegie Mellon. It's basically same type of technology, but then the Carnegie Mellon version of a deep learning neural network. They put him in front of four of the best poker players, Texas Hold'em Poker, last year. And Librantus cleared out their pockets. And now it becomes interesting. Because Librantus was not only capable of playing the moves, was looking at the people, their facial expressions. And if we now have AI that is not just smarter than humans, but better at lying and bluffing, then it becomes really interesting. I think we get into a whole new era once that happens. And also, we get to the point where almost everything that we do as humans is going to be done much better by algorithms. This is the Microsoft uh, Skype translator. Um, you talk into your smartphone in your language, and it in real time translates this into the language of your opponent. You just download the app. My kids have been struggling to learn French for the last eight years. And when they saw this, they said, really? We could just download on an app? I mean, pretty impressive. This is one of my favorite ones. It's called AutoDraw. Maybe you've tried it, maybe you haven't. This is a Google product. Love this. This is for people who suck at drawing. You draw something that says, ah, do you mean that? So you know it says, ah, do you mean that? This is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. It's using AI and the power of the network. And it's basically saying, very simple, I mean, you take AI in the network and draw, and it says, ah, do you mean that? But very soon, this is technology that's going to be built into AutoCAD. And then every you know, designer or architect, the system will say, ah, do you mean that? Or people who do engineering or people who design electronics. I mean, I'm a coder, and we're saying coding is the job of the future, but very soon we're going to have coders who are doing exactly the same thing. Ed, you want to say something? Do you mind a question while you go along on this, so we'd rather save it? No, 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 yeah, open for that. Well, there's two quick questions on AI, since we're into that here. And actually, it's going to be the topic of our next uh, CIO run. Yeah. And you know, as, you're, as a player, you're well aware of some people that are very widely respected in our loss. Stephen Hawking, I think that artificial intelligence is the worst thing that's going to happen to humankind. I'm not, I may be over dramatizing, but essentially that's what they're saying. What is your view on that? So I'll get into that a little bit. I mean, um, I, I subscribe in that debate to the Kevin Kelly version of AI. So Kevin Kelly is the founder of, of Wired yeah, Magazine. Kevin was on a, on a round table? Yeah, he preceded you. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Right. And, and uh, I honestly, I spent a lot of time with the guys who are building the systems uh, in Silicon Valley. But I think the way Kevin looks at it, and, and he probably talked about the fact that maybe AI isn't the next phase, right? Did he talk about that? Yeah, uh, yeah. and I'm trying to remember. Go on a little bit more. So uh, let me put this in perspective because it's important. I think this is a really important thing. When we talk about superhuman AI, many people say, oh, this is going to destroy us, right? And this is what the Elon Musks and the Stephen Hawkins all say. Singularity and the What Kevin Kelly says, and I think this is really interesting, he says, we've always positioned intelligence as it just progresses. And the next thing is that we're going to have superhuman intelligence that is beyond the intelligence of humans. And what I think is interesting is that he looks at it from a biological perspective, where this is the way that today biology and evolution is depicted. And we humans are somewhere over there. And what it means is, and I love his analogy, he says, a squirrel is as evolved as humans, but they just evolved in a different way. A squirrel can remember the position and place of 3,000 nuts over a seven-year period where he stashed it. And this is something where we humans say, why would you want to know where, where 3,000 nuts are? Huh? But for a squirrel, it's really important. And, and his point is that if we look at the evolution, maybe we're going to have intelligence that we can't say it's higher than humans. It's just going to be different. And that's why I think it's an important distinction. And let me put it this way. I really believe that we humans have a very special type of intelligence Namely, we're very, very bad at doing things over and over again. I mean, 
If you remember this cruise ship that sank off the coast of Italy because he wanted to impress his girlfriend, then you think, we have very bad intelligence. Because we think, yeah, it's a good idea to go close to the rocks to impress my girlfriend. That's the type of brain we have. <laughs> so it's not difficult to make computers that are better than humans. <laughs> it's real. That's my position. So, and I, I want to answer two questions. Can an AI discover nuclear fusion? Okay, so take something like IBM Watson. I, they're trying to get IBM Watson to go to medical school and pass the uh, doctors and just get a doctor's diploma by feeding Watson with all the, the literature from the medical profession. So I take the analogy that in the world of nuclear science, okay, where we have humans doing the same things as the guy with his cruise ship, huh, which created the biggest disaster that I had as a child. I, I, we live in Europe, you're far away, but Chernobyl was 1,200 kilometers from where I lived, where all of a sudden the biggest nuclear disaster ever on this planet at that time created a ghost town that um, is fascinating to see, but it was because we thought we were pretty good as humans. So my point is, if you would have let an AI run a nuclear plant, we wouldn't have Chernobyl. But it's not because you feed an AI with all the knowledge of nuclear science that it's going to figure out something that we, it's not like we, oh, we overlooked something. So my point is, I believe humans are incredibly good at doing something that has never been done before. And for that, we need subpar brains that are absolute shit at doing the same thing over and over again. So the question for you is, are you doing a job where you require to do things good all the time? Or are you doing a job where you require to do things you've never done before? Now, keep that in mind, because that's an important thing I want to touch on later on. Ed, you had a second question. So a follow-on question on the AI topic. So one of the uh, other people that we've had to speak to this group Yep. Uh, so he paints a fairly dire picture of the impact on the world of work, and basically a world without work. What is your view on that? I'll get to that. Yeah. Because I think we get to the point where if we see automation, what it's going to do. I love the way Obama looked at that robot. It's a combination of fear and awe. And, and, and I've got, a, I've got a, a really nice job where I can follow a lot of them. This is a, a company out in, in Sunnyvale that built this golf robot, and I don't know why, but this golf robot, you put it onto a golf course, looks at the topology of the terrain, looks at the wind, and, and it does a hole in one on every hole, on every course. Huh? I mean, it's game over for humans, right, basically. Um, yeah. it's, it's the end of a profession, huh? it's the end of a profession. Huh? This is a company called Skydio, they're in, uh, in Palo Alto, they build autonomous drones, drones that fly themselves. And they say driverless cars is so 2015. Yeah? But a drone where you have to balance the weight and intelligence, that's the cutting edge. You've all seen the famous um, Boston Dynamics Atlas, sold, uh, owned by Google, sold to SoftBank uh, just before the summer. So SoftBank is the conglomerate, uh, Japanese conglomerate. And the reason is very simple, is Google owned them, but the majority of these applications were military applications, and Google did not want to be associated with military technology. This is uh, where Atlas is being trained to stack boxes in Whole Foods. Um, imagine that your job is stacking boxes in Whole Foods. Uh, this is my favorite part. This is George, the robot trainer. And here George is training the robot, and you think, ah, oh, what a cool job, training a robot. It's the job of the future. And after a while, you think, is George training the robot, or is he actually bullying the robot? And, and there seems to be a fine line, because he seems to be really annoying the machine. And after a while, you get sympathy with the machine. Very soon, a, a wonderful meme appeared on the internet where the feelings of the machine are shown. 
where the, the sentiments of the device are visualized and where after a while you get to really sympathize with this machine and, and you can only say, you know, certainly when that happens, you, you would totally understand this type of behavior. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, to my point, again, um, SoftBank bought them from Alphabet. People say, ah, oh, this is crazy. Right? The, the, the first thing to realize is, and I think this is essential when you think about AI and automation, I'm always um, reminded of this picture. Everybody knows this picture. Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, 1903. And people say, oh, this is where we humans learn how to fly. No, that's where we did it. We learned it. Every engineer knows that. Bernoulli's Law, 150 years before the Wright brothers, he described how the flow over wing creates lift. And you know what the Wright brothers did? That. They put a 12 horsepower gasoline engine onto a wing, and 150 years after Bernoulli, it showed that it worked. And boom, now you take a plane like you take a bus. For the last 65 years, we've known exactly how to make machines that think. We've known exactly how to make algorithms that can evolve. But the problem is we didn't have the horsepower. And that's why we had so many AI winters and now, with the cloud, for the first time, we've got it. So I believe, I truly believe, that we are truly at this Kitty Hawk, North Carolina moment, at this moment. So in my opinion, what you're going to see in the next 30 years, brace yourself. Is it scary? Yes. Because honestly, we could probably see something that is more impactful than anything we've seen before. Last year, the first self-driving auto truck delivered 50,000 cans of Budweiser beer over a 200-mile journey with no human involved. I live in Belgium. We're not convinced that Budweiser is beer, but <laughs> that's a different debate. Huh? <laughs> but apart from that, I mean, interesting, because if you realize that in 37 states in the US, truck driver is the number one occupation, We've got warning lights. And honestly, we're going to see a systematic shift in jobs. I have no idea when. Hmm? There's a lot of debate about that. But my point is, and that's the whole idea of the day after tomorrow, is that almost every single one of these day after tomorrow technologies is both wow and scary. And can be both utopian and dystopian. Take AI machine learning. Honestly, I can't wait. I'm a really, really bad driver. But if you want to not sleep for a week, read this book, Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom. I met Nick in the preparation of my book. He's a philosopher who works at the University of Oxford. He runs the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford. He works with 10 mathematicians. And for the last seven years, he's been building scenarios of humankind, and he's the most depressing person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and after seven years, he comes to one conclusion. There is no chance that we as humans will survive. So if you thought Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking were depressed, well, don't read Super Intelligence by Nick Bostra. And he's writing down the name right now. <laughs> yeah. So utopian and dystopian. If you look at the world of IoT and 3D printing and robotics, this could lead into a fourth industrial revolution, which is amazing. If, if, if you want to see a really cool company, Carbon 3D is one of the most amazing companies I've ever seen in my life. They do 3D printing where they basically extract, they don't, they don't layer it on, they extract it out of a molten you know, vat of liquid. This is like Terminator in front of your very eyes. 10 times faster than 3D printing and the same quality as injection molding. Crazy. But honestly, the systemic shift in jobs. And my number one question is, do you have politicians preparing your nation for a world of fundamental shift? And the answer is no. And there's only a few countries in the world that are, and that is Singapore and China and Japan. 
Blockchain? Wow. Honestly, if I'd be 22 years old right now, I would start a blockchain company in a second. But if you thought computer viruses were bad, think about the unbounded malignant complexity that's going to be released. AR, VR? Wow. Wow. And not just gaming. Think about education. But if you thought that Pokemon Go was addictive, think about what the next generation of kids are going to have as addictive powers. So my point is, every single one of these day after tomorrow technologies is both utopian and dystopian. And it's up to us to decide what it's going to be. I mean, I, I hope you read a lot of science fiction as a kid, because everything you read as a kid of science fiction becomes scenario planning. And I read a lot of science fiction. And if I look at it, most of the science fiction was dystopian. So the chances of us going the wrong way are higher than us <coughs> ending up on top. In a world that's going faster, VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And honestly, this is where you get into those exponential curves, right? We mentioned Singularity University. Love the guys. The nickname of Singularity University in the Valley is the Church of Wow. Wow. Wow, the church of wow. Huh? Everything is wow. Huh? And honestly, everything is exponential. It's the famous second half of the chessboard, and everything rises exponentially, and we don't understand exponentially. <coughs> you take 50 steps linearly, and you have 50 yards. You take 50 steps exponentially, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and after 50 exponential steps, you've gone around the world eight times into the moon and back. Ah, our brains can't fathom that. And what does Singularity University say? This is linear, and this is exponential, and in the beginning it seems like ah, and then boom, ha, you have abundance. Nice. Honestly, I don't believe it. I mean, I'm more of an S-curve kind of guy. Same thing with S-curves. My favorite exponential joke is when Elvis Presley died. In the United States, there were 78,000 Elvis impersonators in this country. People who would regularly dress up as Elvis Presley and sing Love Me Tender. <laughs> By the year 2000, in this country alone, there were 630,000 Elvis impersonators. And if this would be an exponential curve, by the year 2049, 97% of the US would be Elvis impersonators. <laughs> I just can't see it, you know? But S-curves is the same thing. If you're an incumbent and you see a challenger, then you think here, ah! And this is the most dangerous thing. McKinsey's been using this like crazy, and it's called corporate myopia. If you're not careful and you're not aware, then this is going to be devastating. So think about where you are in your business. Are you here? Are you here? Or are you here? So I became obsessed with this day after tomorrow, what are you going to do? And there are two questions. When and what? what? What should you do and when should you do it? The when is easy. This, is the, this comes from Mark Leslie. Have we worked with Mark Leslie? He's at Stanford. Really, this is the simplest thing. This is anything you do, right? Uh, a new project, a new idea, uh, a new brand. Uh, you start, you grow, you peak, and you decline. This is a cycle of life. When should you focus on the next thing? Not here, too late. Not even here. Yes, if you're doing really well, this is the moment to reinvent yourself. Okay? The problem is, most of you, when you're doing really well, you don't think about the next thing. So I hope you're doing really well, because at least then you still have a chance. And then the question is what? This is the whole idea of the book. How much of your time do you spend on today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow? What is today? Today is the 112 emails that you got while you were sitting here listening to me. That you didn't know this morning you were going to have to deal with. And we spent a lot of time on today. What is tomorrow? Budget 2018. Most of you work in organizations where you spend an insane amount of emotional energy figuring out next year's budget. By the time you have next year's budget, you realize, ah, it's already outdated, but at least we tried. <laughs> So it's a fallacy because we look at tomorrow with what we know today. And then this is 
new ideas, new concepts, new business models, things that could change the rule of the game. How much of your time do you spend on today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow? Many people say 70, 20, 10. Reality, this is your New Year's resolutions. I honestly believe, Glenn, if you, if you drive to work on Monday morning, say 70, 20, 10. <laughs> Friday night, you come back and say, whew, oh, what, what a shitty week. Huh? It was 93, 7, and 0. And then the problem is value. Because this is important, it's current value, and, and future value. But this, this is long-term value. And if it's 70, 20, 10, you're fine. If it's 93, 7, and 0, you are destroying an enormous amount of value protection. Love the model, and then um, this is a true story. I I uh, I went to a, the book was almost finished in November of last year, and I went in Australia to do a workshop. I thought Australia, Sydney, nice big company. Did a workshop with a big Australian company. This was on a flip chart. End of the day, CEO said, Mr. Henson, loved it, learned a lot, had fun. Thank you very much. Too bad your model is wrong. I did. This is the dumbest model in the world. How could this be wrong? And the CEO took a big red pen. This was on a flip chart. He drew that. And he said, you forgot this. I said, what is that? And he said, it's the shit of yesterday we have to clean up, which creates negative value. Australians known for their language huh? and their candor. And I thought, he's right. I, I have to rewrite the book. I literally rewrote the book to take the soy into account. But think about that. How much of your time do you spend on soy and today and tomorrow, and how much on the day after tomorrow? And this is fundamental. And this is something where, th this is why I love the startups. The startups have no soy. That's what makes a startup unique. I mean, humble things, big, famous garage where HP, Hewlett Packard founded HP, famous garage where Stephen C. founded Apple, a famous garage where Larry and Sergey founded Google in Silicon Valley. If you don't own a garage, you're a loser. You need a garage. <laughs> and the analogy I like is plantation and rainforest. If you're a traditional organization, and I'm quite sure Yamaha Motors is a traditional organization, you, you focus. Plantation, focus. Startups, rainforest. Rainforest, dangerous place. If you've ever been to a rainforest, but spiders, insects, snakes, you, you get bitten by a snake, you're dead. The mortality rate of a startup is 95% if you're lucky. So why? Why are they in the rainforest? Because you get bitten by a snake, but the venom could cure cancer. That's the lure of the rainforest, the magical lure of the rainforest. If you are a plantation, you focus. If you run a banana plantation, you wake up every morning and say, Bananas. You drive to work thinking about bananas. <laughs> yeah, well, let's have a meeting about more bananas. Let's have a three-day offsite in Taranella for thinking about more bananas. You have PowerPoints about bananas, emails about bananas. The chances you'll ever do anything else but bananas is zilch. And then some of you say, oh, we're so focused on bananas, we should, we should, we should buy one of those startup and what happens if you take something that's lived in the rainforest all its life and you bring it into the plantation? It dies. My first two startups were acquired by huge corporations, and one of them died in six months, and the other in seven months. And it's very simple. If you take a 200 person organization into a 200,000 person organization, it's not the innovation that counts, it's that the culture is different. The rules of the plantation and the rules of the rainforest are fundamentally different. And if you want to take some rainforest magic into your plantation, you've got to focus on the culture. And that is the trickiest thing. It's mindset. This is one of my favorite startups at the moment. If you have a chance, visit them. It's called Planet Labs. Really cool. Four years old. Founded by two NASA engineers. They built these shoe-type, shoebox-type satellites, and they do secondary payloads. So if somebody launches a satellite, they say, oh, we just have a shoebox. We just shoot it out. Huh? And these, they now have 160 of these shoebox satellites in orbits around the world. And what's interesting is inside the shoebox is the same technology as in your iPads and your smartphones. Off-the-shelf technology. And the reason is they have a very good lens, 
but off-the-shelf electronics because they say speed is essential. And now they have 160 around the world. They start to rasterize the image. If you go to Google Earth and check out your house, the image is, I don't know, three months old, three years old, older. Huh? They rasterize the entire planet every single day with higher accuracy than anything out in space. And what is fascinating is they're capable of doing things we could have never done before. They don't sell the data. They sell the insights. They understand crops. They see crops growing. They sell soybean futures to the hedge funds. They understand economic behavior. They see ships being loaded and unloaded. They sell economic indicators to investment funds. They understand ecology and erosion, sell that information insights to countries and regions. And it's fascinating to see the accuracy. This is my favorite image. This is what they worked on at NASA. This project took 16 years from design to get into space. If you take technology that's 16 years old to get into space, that's like trying to put Windows 97 into space. <laughs> it's true. And they said, we just wrap it in a shoebox, poof, out there. So the point is, it's culture and mindset, not technology and innovation. And I think this is the, the number one thing. I really believe if companies see that their outside world becomes a network, companies have to evolve as well. And this is, in my opinion, the number one challenge. Too many organizations are based on a system that doesn't work anymore. Um, if you try to change anything in a big organization, a plantation, this is the magical formula for the resistance of change. It's a function of the number of employees to the power of the number of managers. And that's disastrous. And that's why many companies have org charts that are starting to look exactly <laughs> like that. They have brilliant people, but incapable to get it out. And this is the irony. I take these executives, like next week I'm taking 25 executives, we go to these startups. Huh? And you have to imagine, next week I'm in a bus with 25 European executives, and the first day they still have their tie and a suit, and we take them to these startups and they say, oh my god, they, they sit on wood. And they bring their dog to work. And they have meetings on ping pong tables. And more dogs. <laughs> and they go back on Friday and on Monday say, we need more dogs. And then we say, no, that's the wrong conclusion. I mean, this fundamental shift of static to fluid, where you have to completely rethink the organizational fabric, is going to be one of the biggest challenges of any organization. Because today, most companies work on a system that is more than 100 years old, that was built for the times when we had large groups of unskilled workers. And today, we see that we have very smart people that are still being trapped in the same type of structures. And that's why we have a lot of people that are not engaged. Gary Hamill has this wonderful thing called the BMI of a company, the Bureaucracy Mass Index, which I think is really nice. Huh? You just go online and you, you fill it in and you figure out what your organizational bureaucracy mass index is. But today we feel that companies want to belong to something that they believe in. They, they don't want to be in this structure of managerialism anymore. And I think it shows that we have a system that work is broken. And it, I think this is something which is really essential because many of the tools that we have to do that are also obsolete. I have a lot of respect for HR people, but the instruments for HR has to be reimagined. I mean, this is where I get to the CIO. And the last 10 years has been challenging for the CIO. Because, I mean, Glenn, people like you, you in the last 10 minutes, yeah. <laughs> but in a world that was changing so fast, balancing that reliability and security with innovation is a really tough job. And that's why, in my opinion, the worst job on the executive boardroom for the last 10 years was the CIO. Because you, you would have your user saying, Elon Musk is building self-driverless driverless cars, and you're still upgrading SharePoint, huh? and that's a tough discussion to have. 
But lately, I've seen a lot of happy CIOs. And it's because it seems to be like a relay race. Because they're giving the worst shitty job of the boardroom to the HR people. Because I honestly believe HR is going to be, he's already left the room. He's, <laughs> he's, he's depressed, right? Yamaha, HR just But I think this could be a golden opportunity. Remember what happened 10 years ago? The gardeners were annoying us with, oh, very soon the CMO will have more digital budget than the CIO. That was below the belt. But it happened. But in HR, it's going to be exactly the same thing. But this could be an unholy union of two very interesting groups who are going to rediscover this world of work of the day after tomorrow. So um, I'm conscious of time. There's still a couple of things I want to do. Um, I'm not going to cover this, although um, I do believe that this idea of intelligence, that's going to be something full on the radar screen of the CIO. And just to give you this as a background, but I've been working on this for some time. Classic IT, as you know, on-premise and focused on reliability. What we've seen is two big challenges for IT in the last couple of years. One is this. I mean, this idea, this is basically what Gartner has been talking about, the two-speed IT. This is where you need to focus on the long cycles, and this is where you need the short development. This is the agility vector. Okay? I think this is the second one, and that's where that whole difference between, and this is what I see with many companies, the difference between built-in and, and bolt-on. Too many companies have a bolted-on digital. Bad, you've got to build that in, right? This is the second big vector. I mean, on-premise and cloud. Stupid discussion, but interesting in the sense that this network element came in. I think if you put it together, you're going to have, I think, an interesting canvas where um, a lot of these network-based technologies where you're going to have more fluidity and leveraging the power of the network is going to be an interesting canvas. So I think it's not just this. I don't think it's that. I think it's being able to paint that bigger picture. Um, but it really means that we have to revitalize IT and, and reinvent IT. There's, there's one more important thing that I, I wanted to focus on is, um, and you touched on it earlier, the societal elements. Um, one of the nice things about writing a book is you read a lot. I probably read about 150 books just to write one book, which is like crazy inefficient, but it's kind of cool. Um, and I was fascinated. I mean, Karl Marx, that we know as the founder of communism, wrote a really interesting book called The Fragment on Machines in um, more than 100 years ago. And he talked about, and think about Google when you're reading this, a general intellect, the mind of everybody on Earth connected by social knowledge with information as the most productive force could blow capitalism sky high. It's like he was describing Facebook and Google 100 years ago. I, I think it's fascinating. This is Waze in LA. Who knows more about the streets of LA? Waze or the city of LA? Waze. It's Asian networks. And I do believe this is just the beginning. Um, and maybe this idea of nations and networks becomes an interesting debate. So one of the last interviews that Obama gave was uh, with the head of MIT, Myer Magazine. And it was fabulous to see a president talking openly about AI, neural networks, machine learning, automation. And he said, we're going to have to have a societal conversation about this. I thought it was kind of sad that he clearly understood these issues. He was leader of the free world for eight years. And only in the last two weeks, he gave an interview in Wired Magazine saying, you're all fucked, but good luck. <laughs> That's basically what he said. And when you look at the US, Trump was elected on the fear of many Americans that they would lose manufacturing jobs. But manufacturing is a very small percentage of what you still do in this country. If you look at services, where the impact of AI and machine learning is going to be devastating. And that's a bigger picture to think about. And I think we don't know what to do. Bill Gates wants us to tax robots. Um, the other 
wonderful discovery that I did was Keynes, who is the, pretty much the founder of macroeconomics, wrote a brilliant book in 1930 called The Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren. And in 1930, he tried to predict what the world of today would look like 100 years into the future. And he got everything right down to two digits after the comma, except one thing. He knew exactly what our quality of life was, our wealth would be. And he said, if that is true, if we live that prosperous and we make that much money, then probably we all have to work about 12 hours a week, which is ironic. But honestly, this is what we're going to have to do again. In this age where I see companies taking notice of this day after tomorrow, I don't see governments taking note of this day after tomorrow, except China and Singapore and in lesser Japan. I mean, if you've been to Singapore, Singapore has built a 20-year technology plan for the nation where they mapped AI, machine learning, all these technologies and said, this is the implication on mobility, this is the implication for education, this is healthcare, and they're executing that. And I'll be the first to say that Singapore is not a democracy. But the way that we are planning ahead, I think is an absolute crime. So I'm with Richard Florida that in this day and age of radical change, um, economy and politics are completely out of sync. And I think that is way scarier than just AI. So um, final notes. Um, we put together, and, and you'll read it in the book, um, a little bit of a, a framework on how to think about the day after tomorrow. And the reason is that if you look at today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and you see it internal, outside, and ecosystem, there, there are plenty of things that you could do. Um, there are a lot of examples in the book of companies that have implemented this day after tomorrow. There are different types of models. But I, I want to leave two things with you. The first of all is I started thinking about how do you, how do you actually do this in a traditional organization. And, and I want you to think about your company and think about two types of people. First is the people who know what they're doing. And second is the people who don't know what they're doing. And um, uh, let me be very precise on that. Because this is no intelligence issue. Because if you look at Elon Musk, Elon Musk for me is the exponent of somebody who doesn't know what he's doing. Because he's really smart, but he's doing something that has never been done before. Okay? So stick with me. People who know what they're doing and people who don't know what they're doing. I spend my life in startups. Startups are filled with 99% people who have no fucking clue what they're doing. <laughs> and maybe you have one gray-haired person or like a serial entrepreneur or a venture capitalist on the board who might know what they're doing. But the reason why startups are successful is you have 99% people who are trying to do things with incredibly smart resources that have never been done before. And then you scale it. And then you have unicorns, and they might have 10% people who know what they're doing, and maybe still 90%. And then if you look at a scale of like Facebook, you might say it's 50-50. And Google is maybe already 80-20. But then a traditional organization might have 99% people who know what they're doing, and maybe 1% who don't know what they're doing. And, and maybe the incumbents, it's even more challenging. And my point is, if you're like a Yamaha, the reason why you're successful in doing the $3.5 billion is because you have a lot of people who, are, who know what they're doing. But if you try and change these people into something new, they say, we've always done this that way. Why should we ever we know what we're doing? And I feel sorry for these people because every company has these one percenters that are trying to invent the day after tomorrow. And the irony is, these one percenters have to spend 85% of their energy fighting these people instead of being able to realize their day after tomorrow. So my challenge to you is find a way to, to unlock that potential and to make sure that these people are actually sheltered. And for that, we've, we've built a couple of frameworks on, on how to actually do that. There are a couple of examples, a lot of examples in the book on, on how that's done. 
And I'd be more than happy to run you through a couple of those examples, but that would mean that I need another three hours, uh, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm here all weekend, so yeah. We have enough food. So. Uh, so two more things. First of all, one practical thing. I mean, I believe that the, the, the essential characteristic of a company to reinvent itself is going to rely on your capability to experiment. And I always take this control and relevance as a big theme. I see many companies, and certainly also many IT departments, focus almost exclusively on controlling what you know and maintaining what you have. Instead on, are we doing enough to reinvent ourselves to be relevant for that day after tomorrow? And I, I always make the joke about the audit committee. I mean, some of you have very good governance systems, uh, bless your heart, um, and some of the most brilliant companies have the pinnacle of governance, which is the audit committee. And I always ask, what type of people are in your audit committee? By definition, the most boring people on the planet. And I don't mean that to offend anyone, because you need in the audit committee people who are making sure you color inside the lines. And, Tick the boxes and follow procedures, and that's fine. But I say every company that has an audit committee should have a counterbalance, namely a disruption committee filled with people who are constantly saying, but why don't we color outside the lines? And, and the mental challenge I want to give you is in your company, who would you put in your disruption committee? What kind of people, what kind of skills, what kind of competencies? Experimenting will be the essential capability of a company to be agile. I love this quote from Mandela. I never fail. I either win or I learn. And I see people saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's easy to say, yeah. But then when you walk out that door and you go sit behind your desk, are you feeling the love of this statement? I meet a lot of really, really weird people in my line of work. And this is one of the top three. This man uh, is a fascinating character. He's called Andre Gein. Maybe you've never heard of him, but he was the recipient of the Nobel Prize Physics in 2010. He's a brilliant, brilliant uh, researcher. He teaches uh, uh, physics at the University of Manchester. Yeah. And he got the Nobel Prize Physics in 2010 for the discovery of his work on graphene. And graphene, as you know, is it's the material of the future. It's 200 times stronger than steel. And it's a superconductor at room temperatures. And it's just the most perfect layer of carbon atoms. And we've known graphene for like 30, 40 years, but we weren't able to extract it to do the tests. And he found out a way to do it. Now, amazing, huh? Nobel Prize physicist, 2010. In 2000, he got the Ig Nobel Prize physics. Now, you know the Nobel Prize physics, the smartest physicist in the world. The Ig Nobel Prize is for the dumbest physicist in the world. Okay? And he got that in 2000. And I'll tell you the story. It's fantastic. He has a, a, a research lab, and he teaches physics from Monday till Friday. Friday night at 8 o'clock, he invites his best students to come back to the lab after hours. He gives them unlimited alcohol and lets them loose in the lab. And this got him the Ig Nobel Prize Physics in 2000 because they were drunk. And they were doing an experiment with superconducting magnets. And they had been able to float a drop of water into a superconductor. And this was like, wow, it's a an anti-gravity drop of water. And they were loaded. And they loaned the frog from the biology lab and threw in a frog. And the frog floated. And people took pictures, and this went around the world. Long story short, he got a reprimand from the university. The frog survived. It was fine. But it was the first anti-gravity frog in the world. And this got him the Ig Nobel Prize physics. But in 2010, they were doing exactly the same thing in the lab. And somebody discovered that if you take a scotch tape and a pencil graphite and you just write on it, 
it creates a perfect flake of graphene. And they're able to isolate that and do the tests, and that got them the Nobel Prize physics. So my point is, you should drink more. <laughs> no, you should experiment more. I love what he said, it's better to be wrong than to be boring. And honestly, I see too many companies, traditional companies, 99% companies, who are so focused on following the rules that they don't have the room to experiment. And I think this is terrible in an IT environment with such technology that is changing so fast. So my point is, it's culture. It's risk, it's strategy, it's ambition. The last thing I want to say, and then I'm going to take a little break, is that we have to be very careful as IT that we don't think it's always going to stay the way it is. I'm reminded of this amazing story that I first heard from the physicist Richard Feynman on the uh, cargo cults. So if you know the story about the cargo cults, uh, this is a wonderful story. So in, um, in Polynesia, in South Pacific, um, when the US was fighting Japan in the Second World War, there were remote islands that were strategically important both for the Japanese and for the American forces. But these were very, very remote islands that had never seen civilization. And they were occupied by tribes that had never been touched by civilization. And all of a sudden, they were in the middle of a war zone. And they had never seen airplanes. They had never seen guns. And what was interesting is the Americans um, were bombarding these islands with supplies. They said, if we ever have like a, one of our pilots stranded here, or you know what, let's just make sure we got enough food huh? and supplies. So you have to understand, these are remote islands, tribes that have never seen civilization, and all of a sudden the US, every day, was just dropping stuff, falling from the sky. And these islanders said, oh my god, there's food. And, there's... and for five years, they thought, wow, we've done something right. There are gods out there who are dropping stuff from the sky. And then in 1945, when the war ended, all of a sudden it stopped. And these tribes thought, we've done something wrong. And they created new religions called cargo cults who were praying to have the planes drop stuff again. And they had built complete... So 20 years later, anthropologists visited these islands and had seen that they had built uh, ships, airships out of straw and landing strips. They had one tribe that 20 years after the war still had a wooden control tower with people with coconuts trying to lure the gods back to keep dropping supplies. Wow. Cargo cults. Why am I saying this? I think we have to be careful as IT departments that we don't think that stuff is just going to drop in our lap. We've got to step up to our game and really embrace this. And I think, honestly, if you're clever as a CIO, you can use this day after tomorrow as a tremendous opportunity, not to implement today, but to rethink what you're going to do in terms of customers, organizational model, business model. I think there's a tremendous opportunity. I'm going to end where I started. This is not the full introduction to A Tale of Two Cities. This is the full, and it's really more beautiful. It's the best of times, the worst of times. It has never been more exciting to be in the world of technology as today. It's the age of wisdom and the age of foolishness. Paris Hilton on cryptocurrencies? Man. People are going to have to rely on us to say what is real and what is fake. Machine learning, AI, there's so much confusion out there. We have to step up to the game to make that distinction between wisdom and foolishness. But if we do, epoch of belief, season of light, spring of hope, winter of despair, I can only wish you a lot of success in the day after tomorrow. Thank you very much.